right. Welcome everyone to the September 8th Portland Clean Energy Fund Grants Committee meeting. Um, we're going to start the meeting as we always do with some virtual participation guidelines. Um, committee meetings are open to the public. The public is invited to comment at around 6.05. Um, and for today's meeting, as we do every other meeting, the public is invited to um, go into breakout rooms and chat with a group of committee members. And so that will be happening today at about seven o'clock for about 20 minutes. And um, then of course there are other opportunities to engage with the staff and with the program at other times. The chat box is open for introductions. So if you wanna put your name, if you have an organizational affiliation, and if you have gender pronouns you want to share, just put those into the um, into the chat box now. And if you want to provide public comment, also indicate in the chat box that you want to provide public comment so that we can call on you and ask you to um, do that when the time is right. Um, the raise hand function and the video, we ask that those are only used by committee members and staff who are participating in the meeting with the exception of the, um, during the public comment period, if folks wanna turn their video on, they um, are certainly invited to do that. This meeting is being recorded and it's also being, um, li it's being live streamed on, on YouTube. And so you can watch the, you can watch it on the YouTube channel later. Um, if you're interested for people who are viewing via YouTube, during the breakouts when community members can um, are having conversation with committee members, you'll just see a, a, a screen that says break for about 20 minutes. Unfortunately, there's not a way to connect those technologies. Um, this meeting also has closed captioning available and you can find that by going to your Zoom menu bar and um, looking for the three little dots for the more menu and then um, scrolling down to view full screen transcript if you want to see the live transcription. So I think that we will start with introductions. And um, again, for anyone who just joined, um, if you're a member of the public, please go ahead and put your name. And if you have an organizational affiliation you want to share, and if you have gender pronouns you want to share, then put those into the chat box. And um, Sam will introduce you after we complete committee member and staff introductions. So let's, I think we'll start with committee members and I'm gonna start with Maria. Hello everyone, Maria Sippin, she or they pronouns, committee member. And Faith? Everybody, Faith Graham, she, her pronouns, um, committee member. Jeffrey? Good evening everyone, Jeffrey Moreland, committee member, he, him. Robin. Hi, everybody. Robin Wang, committee member, he him. Randy. Uh, happy Wednesday, everyone. Uh, Randy Stantino Vittoro, he him, committee member. And Michael Edson Hill and Amanda Squentanyazi are both um, excused from tonight's um, meeting. They're both committee members and Megan Horst is going to be joining us, but she's just going to be a little bit late. So when we see her, we might pause and um, let her do her introduction. So I'm going to move to staff and um, I'll start with myself and end with Sam. So I'm Katie Lister. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm a member of the PSEF staff. Wendy, do you want to introduce yourself? Hi, Wendy Kelfkin, PSEF staff, and I'll be uh, co-note taking tonight. And Janet? Sorry about that. Apparently having trouble with my clicking buttons. Hi, everybody. Janet Hammer, PSEF staff, also helping with notes tonight. And James? Hi, everybody. Uh, good to see you today. James Valdez, he, him pronouns, PSEF staff, and I'll be serving as the tech lead if you have issues with audio or the content. Um, feel free to reach out via the chat function, and I'll try to help you. And Sam. Hi, folks. It's good to see you all. <clears throat> Sam Barroso, he, him, pronouns, um, peace of stuff. Okay, let's go to the chat box. If anyone else has joined and, um, and, and, and hasn't introduced yourself to the chat box, please do so. 
Um, so we've got a handful of folks here with us tonight. We've got um, Marie, uh, Anissa Pemberton, they, them, from the Coalition of Communities of Color, representing the PTEP Coalition tonight, who will be providing public comments. We've got Jenny Hall here. She heard from the Energy Trust of Oregon Solar Program. We've got Derek Thompson. Hi, Derek, co-director of Leaders Become Legends. Uh, we've got uh, Ketty Lope here. She heard from Craft 3. We've got Dina Perot uh, from I Urban Teen and Black Women in STEM 2.0. Uh, we've got Deidre Schutz uh, from Nutrition Garden Rx. She, her. Uh, we've got Kathy Sharp. She, her from the Portland Fruit, Fruit Tree Project. Uh, we've got Huda Yusuf. Um, she, her from EECRC. And I think that is it for now on the on the chat box. But if anyone else has come in and, and, and wants to introduce themselves that way, please feel free to do so. All right. Well, before we jump in, we do have one person signed up for public comment, and that's Anissa Pemberton. Um, before we do that, I'd like to ask that we start with um, reading the guiding principles to kind of center ourselves in the work that we're doing. And I'm just going to move to that slide so that folks can see it and ask committee members to um, raise their hand or just their voice and, um, and read out our guiding principles. I'll start. Um, focused on climate action with multiple benefits. So invest in people, livelihoods, places, and processes that build climate resilience and community wealth, foster healthy communities, and support regenerative systems. Avoid and mitigate displacement, especially resulting from gentrification pressures. Justice-driven, advanced systems change that addresses historic and current discrimination center all disadvantaged and marginalized groups, particularly Black and Indigenous people. I'll jump in on this one and Jeffrey maybe can catch the last one. Community powered, trust community knowledge, experience, innovation, and leadership. Honor and build upon existing work and partnerships while supporting capacity building for emerging community groups and diverse coalitions. Engage with and invest in community-driven approaches that foster community power to create meaningful change. All right, Jeffrey, you want to give it another shot? If you are called in on your phone, you might have mm -hmm. to do the star six thing. Oh, we hear you. Can we you hear me now? You, Jeffrey. Okay, perfect. Um, accountable. Implement transparent funding, oversight, and engagement process that promote continuous learning, programmatic checks and balances, and improvement. Demonstrate achievement of equitable social, economic, and environmental benefit. Remain accountable to target beneficiaries, grantees, and all Portlanders. All right. Thank you all. Um, I'm going to skip back to the beginning of the um, of the agenda, here, at the beginning of the slide deck here, and just um, kind of give a brief um, view of our agenda. Um, Sam is going to give a little bit of a timeline and some, or sort of a reminder about the timeline and program updates. And um, then we'll just jump into what will be the conversation for, um, for the entire committee meeting, which is to a summary of the public comments that were received on the draft RFP2 material. So I'm going to turn it over to Sam. Well, let's, let's maybe, I know we do have one public commenter, Katie, so maybe you want to. That was my fault. I apologize. Anissa, I even wrote your name <laughs> down on my pad and then totally forgot it. Anissa, we have one person signed up for public comment. Yeah. Thank you for that reminder. Yeah, no worries. Yeah. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Anissa. I use they, them pronouns, and I work at the Coalition of Communities of Color as the Environmental Partnerships Manager. As I mentioned, I'm here to represent the Portland Clean Energy Fund 
coalition tonight, um, which passed the ballot measure in 2018 that created this program. I appreciate the grant committee working to meet the needs of the most impacted communities. In many ways, this program is still in its infancy, and I know you all are working tirelessly to ensure that the program meets the goals that we've set out. I wanted to um, briefly talk about why the PSEF program is structured the way that it is. Um, recently, there's been some discussion from mainstream environmentalists about how they would prefer to use the funds, and their proposals so far have tended to um, ignore the ballot measure language and attempt to divert the funds to their own interests. Um, so the PSEF coalition, we put together the ballot measure with the intention of contending with the history of white dominant environmentalism that generally excluded through systemic flaws, low income people and particularly people of color. Um, we are just now starting to see that goal come to life among some of the current grantee projects that I'm most excited about. Um, include updates to low-income people's homes with deathless heat pumps at Fairley Builds, creating job opportunities for formerly incarcerated people at Constructing Hope, and solving for heat islands through green infrastructure at Yoga Punks. The creativity of the grantees shows that our communities do know what systemic changes we need, and we know how to reach them. We need this creativity from BIPOC and low-income communities to create meaningful projects for the most impacted right now, because the climate crisis is hitting our most vulnerable right now. And as the IPCC report uh, released last month made clear, we're locked into 1.5 degrees of warming and well on our way to two degrees. In the last year, we've seen extreme wildfires, deadly heat waves, ice storms, and we remain in an ongoing drought. And the climate disaster is here. Lives are being lost and our communities are vulnerable. And, you know, Portland voters, we've already decided that we wanted to meet this challenge of adaptation by allocating our resources to help the most impacted neighbors survive. Um, and further, we trusted our most impacted neighbors to tell us what they need, and they are doing that. We know that simply retrofitting a single family homes in the city of Portland will require $3 billion at least. Um, and we know that the total cost of the clean energy transition for our city will eclipse that number. So while transportation was not a priority during this, um, during the formation of the ballot measure, that was due to the fact that there was a high need among our most vulnerable for clean energy infrastructure right now. And the reality that transportation will need substantial investment beyond the means of this program. Our most vulnerable will need every penny to survive the climate crisis. And we need to trust them to ask for what they need. A top-down strategy is, is just not going to work because it has not worked. I invite anyone interested in transportation funding work to please connect with me because I share your passion. The PSEF Coalition is currently working on transportation policies and I would love to collaborate with you all while protecting these existing funds for our communities. Finally, there's this narrative that there's experts out there that can save our communities. And while I want to collaborate with technical experts, I want them to support our visions. I believe underlying this dynamic is a rejection of leadership of BIPOC communities of color. And this exacerbates the existing racial inequalities that have led to the disparate impacts of climate change and prevents us from real change that benefits all of us. And I know that there are many well-meaning folks out there, but suggestions that the issue with the grant program is that communities of color need to do what need to do what we're told to do rather than what we want to do is precisely the issue that this grant program set out to address. The values read out tonight are a perfect example of how this grant program is challenging this narrative. And we should all expect some pushback <laughs> as we continue to roll that out. I'd like to add that expertise is really important and the grant committee and staff are staffed with experts in specific fields while representing the communities that this program is supposed to serve. And folks represent labor, education, climate policy, and many other forms of expertise. Most importantly, uh, folks bring their lived experience with oppression, and this cannot be dismissed. To the grant committee, I just want to say, like, please, for, please continue to focus on the most impacted communities. And remember that this is a seven-generation project towards climate justice, and it will not happen overnight. PSEF has no sunset, and thank God, because we have a long road ahead of us. <laughs> There's lots of work to be done. And we need to make significant justice-based changes to the way we do policy, programming, community engagement, all of these issues that I know you all are head on um, tackling by modeling what this looks like. And I know that we're well on our way to making this program effective. 
And I want you to know that the PCEF coalition will be along the way, be there along the way to give you constructive feedback along, along with, um, with, along with other partners. So on Friday, I'm going to share more specific comments that I have on the grant criteria, but for tonight, I simply wanted to restate the PCEF's coalition's continued support of our original vision of a BIPOC-led and centered program, and our intention to continue to protect the fund and to let you all know that we are excited to see the program reach fruition. I look forward to sharing my thoughts with you all about the grant, grant criteria specifically. Thank you so much. Thank you, Anissa. Sam. Hey, <clears throat> thank you. All right, um, next slide. So I just want to start with, again, grounding us with where we are. We're, we're here at September 8th. We're going to just share with you all a summary of some of the public comments we received during the public comment period, which ran from August 16th through September 3rd. Um, and we're going to discuss some of the initial changes and, and hear from you all tonight. And then we're going to we're going to we're going to go back and we're going to regroup and then begin and, and just take some of the feedback we've heard from you tonight in order to what we anticipate is come back Friday, Friday evening and 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 respond back to just additional feedback you all share with the expectation and hope that, that we can, um, that, that you all will, will approve uh, and make a decision on, on at least advancing the, the RFP so that staff can finalize and, and publish the RFP at the end of the month, which is around September 28th. Once we get to September 28th, the RFP will be open for 60 days. So, you know, and folks are certainly eagerly awaiting that opportunity and it'll be out there in, in the public realm for 60 days and, 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 and we'll get to do the good work of helping folks navigate the request for proposal and the application um, before coming back and, and, and beginning beginning the evaluation process that so many of you were involved in last year. So um, I think that's that's largely just what I wanted to share it relates, as it relates to the timeline. I think I, I, I shared this last week and I'll just share this again. We did just come, uh, submit our, our fall budget monitoring process, which is, you know, just two times, three times a year where you can make adjustments to your budget. And so one of those things that, that we've done is just based on the great work of our of our, our finance manager, Jason Ford, who's, in the, who's, who's, who's observing tonight. Um, we've just gotten, a, we're getting a better handle on what it means to operate within our 5%. And we made a request for four additional positions. So this is four positions on top of the one admin specialist that we still have to recruit for. So just want to acknowledge that and share that as I know that's been a point of that's been a point of um, interest for committee members. And then secondly, the the just a heads up for folks that we've been we've been uh, we're in the process of contracting with a consultant to support our some of our internal work on 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 strategic planning efforts and um, and are working with them to make sure that they've got budgeted time on 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 that contract to work with you all as I know that was an expressed interest in your early August meeting. So. What we're going to do is we'll follow up via email, and, and that may not be the right place. And I think maybe that's just a starting place to to start to tease out interest from committee members in in starting to craft out or, or, or work with potentially this contractor in, in 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 strategic planning. So we'd be looking for a subcommittee and just understanding the interest of committee members so that we can come back to that in a in a, in a future committee meeting. But, but at least teasing out interest from that first start, and and we'll do that via follow up email. I think that's it. I know we're running a little behind, so I just I'll, I'll, I'll leave that there with the updates, unless folks have particular questions or clarifications on what I just shared with you there. Okay. Okay. So you know, as as we get into a summary of public comment. I think what I want to just start before we jump into it is providing some background context. You know, leading up to this, and, and it's actually going to take place maybe in, in you know, let's maybe advance to the next slide. I'll, I'll, I'll share, I'll speak to it here in the next slide. So, um, leading into the first RFP, you know, there was a significant amount of labor and love poured in by so many of you all in subcommittees and our full committees. And it was really important to, to gut check that and test that out with the folks that would ultimately apply for the grants and just tease out, did we make it workable? So we did a lot of public engagement for that first RFP. We did, I mean, we we, we, we tagged and pulled in more than 40 plus folks to do one-on-ones. Um, we hosted several webinars. We just, we did a, we did a robust effort and a, and a lot of work in order to see, 
given that it was our first time, it was really important that we get folks feedback on that. We ran that. We ran what I, what I, what I believe was a, a successful inaugural RFP, um, awarded 45 grants. And then we began an evaluation process over several months where we connected with several of the folks that applied and received grants, folks that applied did not receive grants, um, and, and, and a mix of folks that applied for different types of grants and really heard from both grant applicants, we heard from folks that started applications and didn't complete them, we heard from you all as folks that were engaged in our review process, staff members, and, and so many others as part of our, our evaluation process that went into shaping the, the second RFP. I share that to say that there's a lot of feedback that went into that, and it's important as we do that, that while what you all are hearing today is going to be a certain, you know, is, is a different set of feedback and complementary feedback, I want you all to remember that feedback that was shared then, which is certainly no less valuable than, than feedback that I hope is, is, is shared tonight. And so for this for this RFP, however, we did not take that sort of that that same approach. And, and and we can get into what that means and when we take that sort of deeper approach, when we make different adjustments, thematic RFPs, whatever else, but largely because we were adjusting the RFP based on all that range of feedback and building on that, we took really a focused, it, we took a much more focused approach in soliciting feedback where we did check in with a handful of groups around specific criteria we knew we needed to work on. And largely otherwise, we, 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 we pointed folks to things that changed that were substantive around the allocations, the increased funding that would go out and a handful of other, other elements. And so it's just, it's just to reflect a different type of effort that went into RFP number one public comment period versus RFP number two. And so again, this, this correlates to what the efforts that went into the first RFP. The majority of our respondents were nonprofits. Most of our input was offered via email, webinars and, and, and dozens of one-on-one of -on -one meetings. Um, and so it just, and, and, and we, you know, we, we characterized a lot of that feedback based on the organizations, the individuals they represented because of the, the way in which we were able to take in that feedback. For this RFP, most of the respondents were unaffiliated members of the public. Nearly all of the input came in via email as well as online survey. It was almost 50-50 that came in via email versus that came in, those that came in via online survey. And a vast majority of both the emails that, that came in for the, during the public comment period, as well as the survey respondents, were responding to the, the op-ed in the Oregonian by um, Angus Duncan as well as Stephen Ovid. And so it's just important to understand that, that, that context. And so I think maybe before we go on the next slide, I just want to see if folks have questions about our general approach to the uh, the public comment period from the inaugural request for proposal, this one, and 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 any thoughts and certainly any thoughts folks may want to offer on any future public comment period. All right, let's go ahead and move on to the next slide. And this is, and partially what these next few slides are going to do is we're going to speak to the fact that a substantial amount of the feedback in the public comments related to how we are how we are addressing greenhouse gas emissions reductions as well as cost effectiveness in the scoring criteria. Now, I want to start with just sharing when we release this public comment period, when we release the, the materials for this public comment period, the two things that we release, three things really. We released a document sharing the allocations that were that were we were proposing for this this particular this next RFP, and then we released each of the four applications we had drafted for this RFP, as well as the scoring criteria. What we did not release and what we did not share, and this is just it's, it's hindsight, it's, it's 2020, it's 2020. We did not release and share the entirety of the process that an application would move through, because that process certainly has more than just the application and the scoring criteria. And so I think a, a, a substantive portion of the comments related to the, the perception that greenhouse gas emissions um, were, 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 you know, a feeling that they were not um, highly prioritized in, 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 our, um, in, in the program. And I want to address that directly and share how they are prioritized and speak to that. So just that was a large body. And I would say a predominant focus of 
a majority of the comments was the fact that there is a there is both specific comments wanting to see cost effectiveness um, as, as as heavily weighted, but also wanting to see greenhouse gas emission more directly spoken to. And, I, and in this case, an area that I even um, was exchanging emails with one of the other uh, with Megan, who I know is in here right now, and it largely resulted in some by Megan. <laughs> a missed opportunity around communications and just what we could have sort of pulled, pulled the entirety of, um, of, the, of the RFP together. So, and this is information eligibility criteria that will be there as part of the, the RFP that does get released at the end of the month, if, assuming that that's where we get to. And so I wanna just start with stating first, every single project has to go through uh, and be screened for its ability and it's whether it meets or does not meet the eligibility criteria. And one of those core criteria from the outset is that every single one of our projects must address both climate action and advance racial and social justice within one of the program funding areas. And so just by that very nature, outside of largely speaking, outside of the workforce and contractor development area, every single other project has to directly be addressing greenhouse gas emissions. Obviously even workforce and contractor development does so as well, but it's, it's it's a little bit more indirect in that we are training people to be able to do that subsequently. But every other project needs to do so in some direct manner. And so that's just one clear thing that I know we missed. And it's something that I want to say very clearly here that the eligibility criteria is, a, is the first starting place that ensures that every project that comes in has to meet one of our funding areas and address both climate change and advanced racial and social justice. And so just to go through those, that's either that a project has to, you know, meet, um, the, you know, align with the energy funding area. These are renewable energy and energy efficiency projects for residential, commercial, and school-based properties. So these are the things we typically think of when we think of um, clean energy, your solar panels, your energy efficiency projects. We've got our green infrastructure and regenerative ag. Now, these are projects that sequester greenhouse gases, oftentimes in the soils, but because of the nature of what they are, will oftentimes improve water quality, create a healthier environment and other things. And that's just the co-benefits you, you often get with green infrastructure. Um, our workforce and contractor development projects are gonna be, you know, need to provide some sort of job training, apprenticeship programs, support business technical assistance with a focus on economically disadvantaged workers and businesses. And then lastly, we have this category is, of, of innovation or other, which is projects that don't directly fall in one of these other funding areas, but otherwise advance uh, and support climate, addressing climate change as well as advancing racial and social justice. It's within here that we propose that there would be a special allocation for transportation projects to make sure they're clearly seen out in, 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 the, in, the, in the funding areas. And so this is just, I just want to emphasize this, that this is, this is the first screen that all projects must go through. And it's something that we didn't necessarily, we didn't share within the, the public comment materials. Um, and so this is the first screen. So the folks have questions about this and, and eligibility criteria captures more than this. Make sure that projects are happening within the city of Portland, that it's, it, the you know, projects are being proposed by nonprofit organizations and, and so forth. So there's other criteria that are certainly there, but as it relates to speaking to uh, uh, the substance of body of public comments. This is something that wasn't communicated in the public comment material. So I'll certainly share more, but I wanted to start here. Let's see if just folks had questions about that. Okay. We'll get into some of the other comments shortly. Bye. Like Francis has a question or a comment. Uh, actually, I'll save it for after this slide. Okay. A few other places that I wanted to make sure that we're just we're we're, we're speaking directly to this, and I'm, and I'm sharing this with you all since I, I know that those, those comments aren't so it's important to understand those comments, but also share other context that we didn't fully share in the public comment material. There are other ways in which greenhouse gas impact shows up in our application evaluation process. I just spoke to the eligibility screening process um, and, and the fact that projects have to align with funding areas defined within the code. There's also technical screening. This is something that we do to make sure that a project can actually realistically happen, that, that it can be permitted, that it is actually a feasible project. 
Now, I want to be clear, this isn't, you know, we've talked about this before, this isn't about necessarily best practices. I think that that's an area where we, we, we can have a lengthier conversation about best practices and the subjectivity that lies there. But it is about making sure a project can technically happen and be implemented. And so the technical screening is another phase that makes sure that a project as proposed can actually be implemented. And then there's scoring, which we'll talk into a little bit further about other criteria that relate to greenhouse gas reductions, as well as um, cost effectiveness and just how, how we balance those criteria, you know, whether it's and, and all the implications that lie within cost effectiveness criteria. Secondly, I want to speak to regenerative agriculture and green infrastructure projects. It's important from the outset to acknowledge that these projects will never compete well from a greenhouse gas emissions reduction perspective um, on a cost effectiveness basis with clean energy. That, and, 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 I, and I'd argue that, that that category was specifically called out within the code. It is, it is an area that the code asks for 10 to 15 percent of projects to fall within that funding area. And they provide a tremendous amount of community resiliency and other environmental benefits, notwithstanding, you know, things related to climate resiliency, whether that is trees planted for shade or trees, biosoils, green roofs planted to address just, um, you know, address, you know, water quality as well as just water quantity events when we have a heavier rainfall events. So there's just, there's a whole lot of other benefits we get with those green infrastructure projects that are certainly tied to climate resiliency. And then I think before we, I, I think we can just speak to a little bit of cost effectiveness. Cost effectiveness is a criteria that it is, and it is worth in, in the large grant application, it is worth eight points, but we're gonna get into how we balance that and see that as cost effectiveness as one criteria that speaks to greenhouse gas emissions and how that is balanced with, an, with other criteria, which was based on feedback you all received very early on. Um, this was feedback that was shared with, with, with us around what, 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 a, what, a, what, a, what a particular focus or heavy focus on cost effectiveness could do. One, it can, it can emphasize you know, investments in things such as light bulb replacements, build, you know, building controls, things that may be quicker, lighter, easier touch, but don't necessarily go as deep as, as we, as, as all sort of the, all the top building efficiency experts say, we need to go deep in our much to significantly deeper energy retrofit. So cost effectiveness is an important criteria. It exists within the scoring criteria, but it's also balanced with other criteria that we've created uh, over the past, you know, we've created, a, uh, we've created and deliberated on in order to incentivize deeper, um, deeper investments and, and, um, and, and so forth. And making sure folks aren't just cherry picking the, the, the best investments for going deep in, and benefiting communities that way. Transportation is a, it's, it's, it's a it's a it's a tricky one, and I I think that this is going to this is going to be a perennial conversation. I know we will we will revisit, and I just wanted to acknowledge that I know that there's there's deep interest, and I share this for less in some ways for the, you know the committee, but but in some ways for the for the public that we know transportation is important. I know that you all on the committee have, have have emphasized your your desire and your interest in transportation, and yet uh, as 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 Anissa as as others have have shared in the past, it's it's. It's an area that is going to certainly take investments that go well beyond the 40 to $60 million a year we may invest. Um, and it's an area that as we take the program and implement it in the way that the coalition of voters thought it to be implemented, that we come back in a couple of years time and see where there may be gaps and whether, 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 whether that feels like the right place to shift to then. But, but um, it was it was an area that was not explicitly called out in the initiative, and so I, we 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 know that that's an area we wanted to be clear for members of the public that we are going to be calling it out so folks know where it is from us, so that they have the clarity that they know that we see it within the innovation fund and that it sends a clear signal to them so they can appropriately plan their project. Um, and then there's just this uh, the, the the general approach, and so maybe I'm not going to speak to the last bullet, but I think we'll come back to this on on on, on the degree to which we are. As a, as a granting program in our orientation, the degree to which we are soliciting ideas from the community and, and, and providing sideboards around it versus the degree to which we are directed of the community. And so I think we can speak to that shortly, but I wanted to dig into a little bit more of how the greenhouse gas emissions show up in the scoring criteria. And then, and then we'll go to the rest of the, the, the comments. 
Rancis, did you want to ask your question or make your comment now, or did you want to continue to hold on to that? Um, yeah, I just wanted to share the appreciation of reviewing um, uh, these uh, last two slides. Uh, you know, I think it's a good reminder of what's been part of the process um, and uh, in considering what's in the how we calculate sort of and, and, and consider cost effectiveness and greenhouse gas reductions. Um, you know, as I recall, we did have sort of slides sort of projecting when we were looking at the portfolios before we adopted the potential for greenhouse gas reductions. Um, you know, I think it's just encouragement, any opportunity we can to show folks the work behind the curtain, because I think you guys are doing great work and amazing work. And I know you guys are all constantly wrestling uh, around many of these questions. And I know that the public input is really important. Um, so I just want, to, uh, want just appreciation on, on these slides. Um, and I think, I think for me, I think um, anytime I hear cost effectiveness, I don't always hear it. I, I, don't, I don't necessarily always have a positive connotation to that. So for me, it's always as a committee member, what does cost effectiveness mean? What is that formula? Um, and, and how does it balance with those other benefits? Um, and I think, you know, I think, I think Anisa did a really good job earlier uh, today, sort of just sharing like the systems that we've had built in place that use a cost effectiveness model. And these are just more my words, not Anisa's, but um, uh, their comments uh, on this has been, you know, uh, from my perspective, has also been the context of huge disparities on who's benefiting and who, and, and, and disparities around the workforce and, and, and contracting. And I just, so I think I'm digressing here, but I do appreciate these, these slides and I think just how it balances out with other, other priorities from, from the initiative. Um, so anyway, just sharing my appreciations. So the next few slides are gonna, we're gonna go a little bit further into scoring criteria. So it's sort of just to jog folks' memories. And so as you think about the feedback that was shared, you can look to each of the scoring criteria, how they show up because it's a reality. What we've put together is, is complex, and it was intended to address complex situations that we've oftentimes left to the side and, 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 and focus on more simple programs, and, and for, for a range of reasons that all have their own merit. And I think, um, you know, for reasons that uh, there's, 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 there's programs that have left, that have left many, many improvements that, that benefit, and, and both from a climate emissions perspective, but also health benefits on the table for, for many years because of criteria focused on, sometimes overly focused on cost effectiveness. So we're gonna dig into the scoring criteria and it's gonna be really focused on large, this is the large grant scoring criteria as, as a starting place. It's not gonna differ much for small grants, but it will differ for workforce and contractor development applications. So we'll start there just to kind of jog folks memory and, and it can hopefully spur a conversation here. You now we'll have about, you know, we, we have about 10 minutes before we go for break. So I'm just gonna move through the next, all the, I'd like to move through all the points and then come back and give room for a conversation, if that works. Okay, next slide. And maybe Sam, just real quick before we move to the next slide, just a reminder to folks that the cost effectiveness criteria is labeled GHG impact and how that's calculated is, you know, calculating the GHG impact divided by the um, PSEF grant request. Okay. So these are the five criteria that are, in a sense, directly related to the greenhouse gas emissions reduction. And so most closely related. So the one, you know, the one criteria you have here within the scope is about the, the fact that the services, activities, and timeline described will realistically result in the intended outcomes. It's saying that this project, as, as proposed, it already that meets the eligibility criteria, is, is, is going to be able to line up and be implemented within this timeline. We have, and that's about five points. We have about two points set aside for um, to, to incentivize and, 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 and score whether there is an appropriate plan to maintain a project for its full useful life. This criteria doesn't exist within the small grants, but for large grants, it was, it was, this is one of the differentiators. It was important that if folks are installing solar panels, that they purchase a warranty so that there is an inverter replacement happening at year 15 or 20 or whenever that, that's due so that we can utilize them for their full 25 years. 
And so, or, or that there's a maintenance plan in place for green infrastructure projects to make sure that the trees that are planted tomorrow don't die off a few years as they're, as they're, as they're young and need that extra support. Um, or just to, to make sure that folks are properly using the things that are installed within their homes and that there is a, there's a plan in place here. So it's just, it's, it's, this is really about making sure the things that we're investing in, that we're able to fully realize the greenhouse gas benefits over the, over the full life of those investments and that those aren't short lived. And so that's just another way in which we're putting that emphasis on, on greenhouse gas emissions and making sure that that fully comes through. There's indirect greenhouse gas sequestration criteria. This is about teasing out to what extent a project can create indirect benefits. And by indirect, we mean that projects can have an education component, can have a community engagement component that may promote other folks going out and doing something. And those are, those are valuable actions. We know that behavior change, all those efforts do materialize in real emissions reductions. And so whether that is uh, a, a mosque putting a solar panel on, doing education about those solar panel and encouraging folks to, 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 to explore those options or, or, or connecting people to incentives, there's indirect benefits associated with those, those, those. And so that's two points. We've got, and this next criteria is, is, is one of the key important ones, about eight points going for projects that reduce costs for people with low, for, for, for people with low income, black folks, Native American, Alaska Native folks, and other people of color. Now this criteria is where we really were balancing the cost effectiveness criteria, which is the, the last criteria on this page. What we were indicating here and what we were promoting here is saying that we want emission, this is a lot of discussion. Do we wanna go shallow and touch a lot of homes or do we wanna go deep and drive real benefit and real cost savings that materialize and accrue in people's wallets? And so this was that criteria here that was driving for um, for cost savings, utility savings, at least 25% was the scoring criteria for the most points. And so that's just one way that we take cost effectiveness, which is important, but also balance it with a criteria that, 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 that pushes for deeper energy, deeper, that prioritizes or incentivizes deeper, um, deeper retrofit, um, and deeper, more, more, more uh, highly beneficial green infrastructure projects or gender bag projects. Okay, next slide. So it's about 25 points there. And this is all saying that already these projects meet these thresholds. Now there's an additional 18% of the points that are very much highly correlated with greenhouse gas emissions reductions, but not directly related to necessarily. So oftentimes we've got six points associated with providing health benefits. That's most of the time with, a, with an efficiency project, that's gonna arise because you've tightly sealed up a home. So you've done something else, and you've addressed ventilation as part of it. You've addressed mold, you've addressed something else and made sure that the home is breathing properly, but also tightly sealed. So those points are oftentimes gonna go, gonna, gonna go alongside. Not always, but, 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 but although we suspect the majority of time in the instances we've thought through. We have climate resiliency. As it relates to green infrastructure, this is planting shade trees and making sure we have more trees that grow bigger, that create shade. And so that's a place where you could see climate resiliency benefits, um, but also heat pumps. That's a, that's a perfect project that would benefit or that would achieve these points here is that things that, are, that such as ductless heat pumps or, 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 or other heat pumps provide cooling, which is a resiliency benefit. And then lastly, there's this criteria, which is alignment with the guiding principles, which speaks more holistically, certainly to the greenhouse gas emissions associated with the project, but certainly other, other, other elements of the guiding principles as well. And so there's just another 18 points that are highly core, that are gonna be highly correlated with, um, with, uh, with, with greenhouse gas emissions reduction. Bye. And then these last set of points we want to speak to are, these are the scoring criteria that are associated with more equitable outcomes. And so this is about worth, this is total is about 34%. So this speaks to whether the organization has a track record in benefiting and serving um, Black people, Alaska Native, uh, Native American, Alaska Native folks, other people of color and people with low incomes. It's about seeing whether the, the staff, board and seat leadership of, a, of an organization that, that's applying in a, lead, in a lead position reflects the community that they intend to serve. It's about the application demonstrating a strong practice of community organizing, outreach, stakeholder engagement, focused on sort of marginalizing such a diverse community. Because 
we want folks that understand how to connect with communities and, and actually make projects happen for, for the communities are intending a benefit. Also about inclusive contracting and subcontracting because as, as I certainly, as, 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 uh, as, as committee members have shared, this is just, this is an incredibly important part of the program in making sure that those economic benefits are accruing to, uh, uh, accruing to uh, both women, people of color, folks with disabilities and others. And then scoring criteria on the, per the percent of project benefits going to specific party populations, and then uh, a particular two points going to projects that pay uh, prevailing wages for workers in trades for which prevailing wage is defined. So these are just, and, and this sums up to 34%. And I think as you contrast and see this, as compared to, I think, the, 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 the previous two slides, I just would part for you that this is one of those areas that we can, there, 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 there's certainly a lot of thoughts and suggestions, and this is, you know, this is our best attempt at navigating what we, how we incentivize these things and, 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 and so forth. But the eligibility criteria is going to be an important place where that is something that doesn't exist on this side, but the, in, in a direct way. But the eligibility criteria for greenhouse gas emissions reductions projects or, or for clean energy and regenerative ag and green infrastructure projects are, is going to necessitate that those projects are reducing emissions from the outset. It's just the degree and how do they reduce emissions. But that may be. Let's go to the next slide. Let me... so we got here and I think I'm seeing that we've got three minutes left. So I'm actually not going to go through this slide. What I might ask Katie, if you go back to the slide, I might ask before we, we, we send you all off into a momentary break and then and, and bring you into just more of a community conversation space. Just want to see if there are clarifying questions about these last three slides that are that are focused on the large grant application, but I want to see first if they're clarifying questions. Robin, I don't really have a question; just more a comment. First, I really appreciate uh, you sharing this. Um, you know, for those of us on the committee, we're not in this day to day as deep as as you guys are, and I remember talking about a lot of this stuff and having discussions about a lot of this stuff, but. Um, this stuff doesn't jump out at me. So I really appreciate you, you sharing this with us. Um, if you can go back one or two slides, this is just more of a comment. Um, and uh, I just have a, a, a slightly different opinion. Katie, uh, this, um, this one, oh, no. <laughs> the one that has guiding principles at the bottom. It has the guiding principles at the bottom. Yeah, maybe the board. next uh, one. The next one. Yeah, yeah. so okay. I, I, I would almost put this one uh, in the previous slide um, because, you know, the guiding principles have a strong element of GHG reduction, and I don't see this as kind of a, a, a additional criteria. I, I think the guiding principles have baked into it a, a strong, you know, greenhouse gas emission principle. Uh, on the flip side, if you go to the previous slide, um, there's one comment there or one item there, criteria there around uh, low income. And um, I'm, I'm not disagreeing with that criteria, but I, I would say that that criteria maybe would belong to the next slide um, because it is possible for someone, if you just look at this criteria solely, um, to propose a project that um, uh, does reduce costs for, for people with low income, uh, et cetera, uh, but not necessarily directly impact greenhouse gas uh, reduction. So um, just my thoughts, I would kind of just swap those two. The numbers still end up the same, um, but I just wanted to kind of state that, you know, just just put it out there. So thank you. Thanks, Robin. Megan? Hi, do you hear me? Yep. Good. Yeah, actually, Robin covered one of my points, which was a pretty similar comment to that. And in addition, I would just add that um, an observation is in the greenhouse gas slide. I know we maybe interpret some of those as direct connections to greenhouse gas emissions in our interpretation, but I, I, I think we, it could be clearer, the connection to an average reader, like the, that the project results in the intended outcomes. What we mean is the intended outcomes related to climate change and social equity. And so to us, that's kind of clear that there's a clear climate action and green and social equity component there. But I I know many of our commenters didn't think that was very clear. So I feel like 
we could just be even clearer. And the same thing about the project life maintenance one, um, I could see how uh, that might have meanings that aren't directly related with greenhouse gas. So perhaps there is some additional language we need to add if that's the focus we want or something else. And yeah, and I also agree with Robin's earlier comment or observation, I guess, clarifying notion. <laughs> Faith. Sorry, I'm negotiating about dinner also at the sideline. So, but I'm here with you right now. I just had a point of uh, clarification. Um, Katie, you offered a definition of cost effectiveness as we mean it. First of all, I think these slides were really, really helpful. <laughs> and so thank you. And I'm really hopeful that others see these as well. Um, and in response to Ranfis's question uh, and comment, you explained what we mean by cost effectiveness. And I just think it's, it's because that's a term of art used in many different spaces, it's important for us to be clear on what we mean. So can you remind me again what you said? <laughs> so it's, it's the GHG impact criteria and it's worth for large standard grant applications, it's worth eight points. And it's really the only place in the application where we look at the sort of like how many dollars invested equals how many CO2 e um, it, you know reduced or sequestered. And so what that um, that criteria is calculated by staff by um, with using input that's given in the applications, and we kind of come up with a for each project. This is what we think your GHG sequestration or um, or emissions reduction will be divided by the dollars that we're investing in it. So I think the, um, I mean, there's obviously, that's, that's a pretty simple cost effectiveness test, right? Like there's lots of costs that um, are kind of not a part of that equation, but it is just a really like simple dollars or CO2E per dollar invested. So I'm super uh, clear with the simple definition. I'm much more clear than I am with any other cost effectiveness definition. So thank you for that. And I appreciate the simplicity for sure um, for PSEF. Are we assuming then that we're the scoring is the relative, are we basically comparing projects, applications to one another to come up with what the score is? Or is there a target percentage in the evaluation criteria for determining a score? The cost effectiveness, Sam, did you want to answer? Yeah, I mean, I think, Katie, I think this is where, I think what Faith is asking about is we, we, we will take all of the clean energy projects. And so now we do them separately. That was a key learned takeaway from what we did last year, green infrastructure, regenerative ag, and clean energy projects. All the clean energy projects will be taken. That calculation is going to be done. What are, the, what are the projected greenhouse gas emissions reduced for this particular project proposal over the life of the project? And then we're going to divide that by the the dollars that are that are being asked for for this project. So cost effectiveness for us, how much we're how much we're getting per dollar we're investing. And then we're gonna we're gonna rank them across quintiles. We're gonna rank them. We're gonna say here are the projects that are most cost effective. Next set, next set, next set, and then they get points based on where they fall, ranked amongst each other. So it's it's it is it is based on how they compare to each other. So. Um, I can exactly get it. I distracted and say which ones are the most efficient versus least efficient, but but yeah. If there's no other questions right now, I think we are just about four minutes over, and we're going to jump back into this same conversation um, when we come back. But I I don't want to want to try and. Um, remain accountable to the public who showed up and um, might have an expectation of hopping into a breakout. So we are going to start that break those breakouts about five minutes late so that we can have a true five minute break. So if everyone can turn off your cameras for five minutes and then when you come back at 7.05, James will separate committee members into different breakout groups and members of the public will be able to drive themselves um, to different breakout groups if they're participating with um, via Zoom. All right, see you back here at 7.05.
Hey, it's good to see everyone back here. I, know, I think we were able to keep more folks. Um, so I think we've got, we, we heard some good questions and some good feedback from, from you know, Rob and Megan. And then I know that we, 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 we paused to go into and take a break. I, I certainly would love to, before we, we move on, would love to hear if there, if there are any other lingering thoughts related to the sort of the way we categorize, not even just the way we categorize, but just in the scoring criteria, because we're going to now pivot to otherwise, we pivot to some of the other feedback and, and considerations that you all should hold as you, as you think about some of the comments that were shared. So I just, I don't want to jump to that if, if, if folks have something lingering there that, that they did, they did want to speak to related to, um, related to the previous slide. All right, so I'm going to speak to the next set of, you know, other, other, other elements that came up in the comments. And I think these, really these next three bullets are going to be coming and, and, and largely were in response to the op-ed by, by Angus Duncan, as well as Steve Novick. One, there was a, just a general concern related to accountability to outcomes that, that, that were raised in I think the, it, this is this is going to be our perennial challenge in terms of just communication, and and it, it's certainly work that is that they were doing. But you know there is there's rigorous reporting that that we that we expect from our that our grantees, you know, on a quarterly basis, both on what they've done and 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 backing that into what are the GHG emissions associated with each of those 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 widgets that they've installed, the acres that they've planted, um, as well as you know, for the, the folks that they've trained as part of their, their efforts and, 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 and jobs extension placements that they've landed. So there is, there, there's, a, there's a range of reporting, but I think that this is just a, this is a placeholder and this is work that I know we need to come back to and, and, and support the subcommittee in doing, but there's also just how we share out and report to the public on, on the outcomes of the program and, and how do we speak to that? And it, it certainly comes back to how are we telling the success stories of the program, both in the the real stories of the projects that are coming through, but but also how are we collectively uh, speaking to the, the outcomes of the program? And so that's 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 um, that's a conversation we've picked back up within the committee so that we can bring that to the, the reporting and evaluation subcommittee and 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 bring folks back together as, as we've been you know I know as a lot of our attention has gone to focusing on the RFP. So it's just. That, that that's work that is happening. That that's work that has been happening in the reporting and evaluation subcommittee, and we'll be we'll be prompting that as staff to to, to to bring the group back together to come back to that shortly. There's just a, a second body of a thread of comments related to experience and expertise, and 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 um so in, in, in seeking out whether that is saying that there should be you know both traditional and technical expertise that is valued or prioritized on projects and, and 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 just that how that actually connects to the real community expertise that exists uh within these projects now we certainly you know our application is set up so that we are able to both you know look more holistically at experience and how project teams are coming together and bring that experience um acknowledging that there's both real community expertise and connecting with community and building trust with community, both in, in, in the ability to go in and go into folks' homes, as well as uh, the ability to get folks to engage with projects. So I just, I think there is that, uh, I think it's, it's different perspectives on what that looks like. And that's something that we're gonna have to consistently um, be able to speak to is um, we absolutely value experience and expertise and, and, and really breaking that down in terms of understanding what are the different experiences and expertise that, that, is, that is relevant for us to, to be able to, for us to both evaluate and, and speak to. And there's just a, a threat of, and, and I think we've, you know, this is something we're gonna consistently wrestle with. It's a, threat, it's, it's a conversation point that I know has come up within, you know, in different ways within the committee, but it is, we've got an application here that is really, you know, it, it's, it's allowing community to tell us what they want to do, with, certainly within the boundaries and allowing us to evaluate the variety of and the, all the ways in which those proposals may come to us. There is certainly alternatively the approach where we tell folks, these are the things we want you all to do. 
and I think we've, we've you know, just, just as a reminder, that made, there's been a lot of discussion around that, and I think that's something we're going to come back to um, after we, you know, this is a this next round is a significant funding round. Last year, as we know, was our, our update round for us. As we see in this next round and potentially the second round, we're going to start to get a better sense for whether there are areas where there are funding gaps, where we aren't seeing community proposals where you all as a committee may decide you want to see those proposals. So that opportunity will certainly be there to take that holistic look and come back and, and be able to start seeing where those are. But, you know, it's, it's a question of what's the orient. I think there's a push for that orientation to be directing and some of the comments are being more directive of community to see projects in certain areas. Um, there was um, comments around just challenges regarding workforce and, 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 and contractor utilization. Something again that this is this isn't this isn't necessarily new. It's something we're going to consistently wrestle with. Is just what that looks like, and so and 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 how do we, given the 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 diversity of projects that PSEF can support, uh, there this is going to be a con this is a continuous conversation we're going to have to be engaging with is what it means to um, meet certain workforce and contractor utilization goals across different project types. And so that was just the, one of the threads of, of some of the comments. Um, we connected with a handful of organizations serving people with disabilities. And, you know, what we did hear from a subset of those that work with, you know, people with intellectual and developmental disabilities is that the criteria specifically that, that we have the, around um, scoring how the organization reflects the community that they serve does not necessarily work for those organizations um, for, for a range of reasons. Some of them are, are systemic in terms of criteria that the state has around the folks, the, 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 the individuals and guidance they have around who they can actually employ within their organization. So that was a conversation we've, been, we've engaged in and we've, we're, gonna, we're gonna chat about some of the adjustments and that'll certainly be one of the areas where we've got, we've got suggested fixes. You know, there's just a range of areas where, as, as, as folks already picked up on this, I certainly heard this a little bit in the in the breakout discussion earlier it, 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 that, that we just came out of, um, but just communication challenges in, in some areas leading to misunderstanding or confusion. This is something that we've we've always, um, it's something I know we're gonna continue to have to have our eye on. And then over time, as we have a better grasp on things that aren't changing within the program, we're gonna have to come and spend greater focus and greater emphasis and greater energy on just just building out the content to really help folks through various means understand how all of these pieces connect, but also consistently push ourselves to simplify the language. And that that that's um I, I don't want to come back to that that that's hard. That that's a, it's a it's a hard process. And given that um it's it, it, it's something that that we're we're, we're certainly thinking about and, and and have between now and when the RFP gets published, we'll be working on just addressing those those small little tweaks. There was just feedback around whether, you know, whether we would do partial funding or whether it's really an all or nothing. So that was just, that was again raised. It's something I know that was raised and discussed last round, but that, that, that was something that was raised in the comments. Um, and then just an interest in the city identifying benchmark projects that the grantees will do. And it's just it's various threads to um, provide examples. And that's something, that's stuff that we will do. We will elevate the examples of last year's funded implementation grants and make sure that connecting with grantees that we're appropriately speaking to those projects, that's something we will do, but also whether there is, there's, a, there's, a, there's a place to provide more sort of benchmarking or guidance. And so just wanna check if there are any questions about the, the, the feedback in this slide before we sort of just talk a little bit about some of the, you know, some of the ways in which we can respond, as well as some initial recommended changes that 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 we've we've, you know, that, that we've certainly thought through. And you know, this is an area where we welcome we welcome discussion, we welcome questions. We can certainly pivot to the some of the initial changes we're thinking about because what this helps us do is, you know, really huddle back and and and, and connect with a team tomorrow and start discussing other ways in which um, other changes we may want to want to recommend to you all based on just your, your thoughts and reflections that you share here. Okay, you're muted. I got double muted. Jeffrey? Yeah, uh, 
the um, for the, the workforce and contract utilization, the challenges that came up, was that primarily for the large grant or was it for also for the small grants? It was, it was primarily the large grant. And, you know, with the large grant, we're taking a different approach this round where we're telling, you know, for, for single site projects over $350,000 that are getting $350,000 of pizza funds, we are telling them that they've got to hit certain, they got to commit to certain workforce and contractor equity goals, both around their utilization of uh, both women and, and minority or POC owned firms, as well as the their 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 workforce itself the the folks that are working on the project to making sure their apprentices as well as their 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 journey level trades uh are are are, are hitting certain certain goals for both women and people of color and then lastly also apprenticeship utilization sort of rates so those are the those are the, those are the sort of three areas where we have where we have criteria and we shifted the you know the race to the top approach was it was. It didn't quite get there, given in all the things, that, all the ways in which we wish it did. And so this year we we adapted that and said these are the goals. Provides a lot more clarity of folks. And you know, the comment in this particular instance was, you know, in, in, in affordable housing is always it, it, it's going to be we're going to we you know we think things we've wanted we, we've we've shared we want to see projects in that sector. And um, for some of those, you know, I think the comments that were shared, Jeffrey, was that in some instances the projects you know we're and it shows in a couple of our projects even funded last round that we're just funding a small portion of the overall project you know the project is already whether it's a new construction project or whether it's a significant major rehab of an existing affordable housing we're coming in and we're funding a small portion of those energy upgrades to, to make that to make that project better and so they've already you know they already have all their contractors on board, their subs on board, and they may just be taking on a piece of that work. And so it, it, it's, you know, it, it may be, it may be challenging for them to, um, to hit those, hit those goals. Katie, I know you've, 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 you've reviewed those a little closer. So please chime in if I, if I characterize that incorrectly or just missed any details related to that. So some of the I know the, the one that I particularly shared. Yeah, I think it's, I mean, in, I think it's what you said, Sam, but it's also just even if they haven't started, I think some of the feedback that we got was just that the goals that we were putting out there would be really difficult to to hit, and um, and so that there was a suggestion that they be reduced, and um, and so that was and and those were comments from sort of larger multifamily developments, um, not necessarily the smaller smaller operations. But they wouldn't have three hundred and fifty thousand at a single site, so it wouldn't really wouldn't really apply. So, and we've got we've got a. We, I, I want to share. We do have a recommend. We do have we, we do have a recommendation that'll speak to some of that. But um, yeah, yeah. I guess I would just add that we certainly expect that folks will continue to tell us that goals that and, and we hope that goals that we set would be challenging you know we don't want to set goals that are super easy to meet we want some sort of stretch but um not that we would disregard anyone's input but just that it's not um it's also not surprising I mean, there's a reason we need the goals so sure. and peace yeah i want to chime in too I, yeah i agree with jeffrey on this um you know, I, I would love to, you know, find a way to get some kind of disclosure around the public investments that are going in, into some of these these projects, um, especially like big development projects, because I'm having a hard time not seeing how other public investments are going into multifamily. But I, I think the promise of PSEF is to challenge institutions that are investing in here, and there's no excuse, I think, to see disparities in in key trades, um, and, and to see disparities in in how businesses op uh, operate, and, uh, and see the opportunities there. So, do you want to continue finding ways to challenge those those institutions? Um, I, on the bullet point on um, um, reflecting. Um, community served or is not working for 
organizations um, with people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Uh, I am personally interested um, to learn more of this. I'm willing to take some time off, um, you know, to just hear from other groups on this. So I just want to, for staff, if there are any opportunities to engage with groups um, as you're doing the outreach, um, please um, uh, let me be part of that conversation because I definitely want to want to learn and um, I think I think you recognize here in this on, the, on our committee um, I think it's an area for growth um, and, and I think we're just lacking that representation right. maybe maybe I guess it's hard to say that but at least I think it's an area for growth for for all of us to understand um, these issues especially on the workforce side thanks Francis got Jeffrey and then Megan yeah, kind of just to reinforce what Ramfi, Ramfi's just said. I mean, a lot of these projects that they're talking, especially these profit development projects, they traditionally have been the ones that have locked people out of the industry, just being quite frank with people. And then on top of that, you know, I've seen big, bigger projects with way more money on the line that get, get higher diversity goals than the ones even you guys have um, established on this. So I kind of think there's a cop out and kind of the, you know, the, the status quo kind of deal. So I just want to say that for for the record, but yeah, this is this is this is there's a reason that we need to need to have aggressive goals like these because of how traditionally how things have been operated up to this point. Thanks, Jeffrey. Megan. Thanks. Yeah, I just want to follow up a little bit on Ranfis's question on the further clarification or looking down the line to hear more from staff on the on the comments you've been gathering about the criteria for reflecting community serve for organizations serving folks with disabilities. From my um, looking through of our grant application, it seems like it would be specifically in the criteria that's about staff representation, but I'm, because I think boards, I've seen boards serving folks with disabilities that include members of the disability community on their board. So that seemed very feasible to me. And it may be that they have a two different kinds of boards that work um, simultaneously, and I've seen that in orgs. So I'm guessing if it's just that one criteria, it seems like we could possibly have that. Yeah, I'm just, I guess I'm curious to have an expansive conversation around what the issue is and what some workarounds are, or if, um, if that really needs to, yeah, I guess just want to learn more <laughs> and push on the importance of that. Sam? Did you want to speak to that at all? I mean, I will I will share that, and I think that we need to sort of like compile some of that. We um, compile some of the sort of notes and email traffic that we've been having back and forth with folks. But um, we've been really learning a lot about, we've been learning um, some about some of the like systemic um, barriers to being able to meet those thresholds. So um, for, for specific types of organizations that are like just part of the law in Oregon. And so learning about that and kind of realizing that there needed to be an adjustment made. I guess the only comment that I wanted to make um, is that for sure the organizations and, and the people that we have been having conversations with, they they have all, they have expressed us that they like this criteria. They like the spirit of it and the purpose of it, and don't and want don't want to sort of like dilute that and dilute that intent. And so I guess I just wanted to share that that it wasn't that people were like, no, we can't do that. It doesn't matter for us. I think people very much were saying like, yes, representation does matter for us, but here is the the world that we're operating in, kind of, and we're you know we're learning about that more now. Katie, I think that's true. That's, that's, that I appreciate that. That's, that's, I don't have much, maybe just a similar acknowledgement that this is it's both an area that there's a lot that we're, that we, we, we have to continue learning about, um, but also just the, um, there is, you know, and in certain areas, you know, I know we're, we're specific. It, it, it's not necessarily, um, you know, we're, we are being specific about developmental and intellectual disabilities because of a particular state statute. So there's there's just there's there's this part of this is that it is going to be a longer, it's going to be a little bit of a longer journey. I don't always know if it neatly sort of it neatly lines up with the work that we do with the scoring criteria, but it's it's certainly a longer conversation. Um, and 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 we'll um, we're happy to 
to whatever extent, if it's, if it's, as it relates, because we do have draft language we've shared with folks and we've gotten feedback. And so we'll bring that back to you all on Friday around how to adjust this criteria to be responsive to this, this, this feedback. But um, it's, it's, uh, I know that this is, this isn't going to be the only time. This isn't going to be on, this isn't going to be the only adjustment, but this is one of those that we've got to be in conversation a bit longer. Okay, and then just going back to um, maybe we'll speak to it in another slide. And I don't know, frankly, Katie, what I'm trying to think about is I do want to just acknowledge that there is this, uh, you know, we are going to be, we, we're, we're waiting on, 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 uh, on, on working through the city contracting process on, on, on conducting this market study to better understand, because I do, do want to share it just so that I don't, don't discount one of the particular one of the comments that were shared around the work, workforce and contractor equity, uh, you know, uh, uh, elements of the, of the RFP. But it was I think the example that was given is is if, if, if and, I, and I, I I'm happy I think I'm happy to be corrected and I'm and I'm happy to be pointed in the right direction to get to, to for us to get more information. But well, the, the example that was shared was just a. Uh, an organization doing a you know a, a, a ductless heat pump installation across a multifamily property, and that's that's really the scope that they would apply for for PCEF. And this may you know this may complete many this may bring together many things, but I know their particular concern there was just for that part of the PCEF scope, could they for that specific scope could they get could they hit the apprenticeship utilization targets because that would be that's at least one project that they were considering. Um, and so I don't know how that necessarily extends to some of the other criteria, and obviously, and, and I know that they've that the, some of those concerns were stretched to beyond just the apprenticeship criteria. But I think there's just this place that we know that we're going to need to continue doing work, building up our understanding of both the sectors and where those pain points exist, so that we can, um, so that we can we can push from a place of being informed. Um, and that's something that we're going to do. And I think we've got a great place that we're starting from. But I just, I also don't want to, I, I wanted to acknowledge the comments there and also provide a little bit more clarity if it helps at all. I don't, I'm not, I'm not saying that it does, um, but it just, just provide more clarity uh, if, if that, that context helps at all. Yeah, on that, on that comment, Sarah, uh, Sam, I don't want to take too much more time on that. But um, yeah, I think, I think uh, for every, and I think I've noted this in my comments in the past, but I think every anytime we're considering apprenticeship, you know, goals, like I think making sure that we're considerate of each skilled crafts um, apprenticeship ratios. So the apprenticeship ratios for each classification is different. Different. So an electrical worker could be really different for um, an HVAC installer or. I guess in this case, uh, someone in, in uh, installing a ductless heat pump. So I think I think there's there is a very um, important um, uh, technical consideration, and I think I do want to strongly encourage staff to reach out to um, Bowley and their state apprenticeship training council. And I know we've had Steve Sims in the past, but I think um, I think there's new leadership there, so it's worth reaching out if there's an opportunity for that. Okay, let's move to the next slide. So I think we've shared this before with you all. Yeah, you know, there's a few ways in which we can respond and it both changes the application, changes the scoring criteria, or, or just improving the clarity and accessibility to increase understanding for, 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 for individuals. Um, and that last one, really, it's gonna it's it's, it's gonna take place over that next month, and so we release the RFP. So this is gonna we will we will be working consistently on number three. Um, considerations, just as you all are, are thinking through about any potential changes you you want to be all considering and respond to in response to the comments, is just whether we should do additional consultation. You know whether the, the post change addresses the concern raised. If we are talking about reducing information collected because that, that was a threat of one of the comments, what are we losing? Are the changes consistent with our, our code and guiding principles? Um, and does the change honor all the input that we've received? You know, particularly, you know, given that there's been a lot of work in the past public comment period, a lot of the evaluation work, but particularly from BIPOC-led organizations, um, regardless of what they were doing. And share this 
and then um, move to the next slide. And I think that might get us pretty close to home here before we turn it over to you all. These are just some of the recommended changes based on um, the, the public comments. So we are, and we'll come with more, you'll see more specific language on Friday. We are asking for uh, or, or, or suggesting a modification to allow flexibility for applicants who primarily serve people with intellectual and developmental disabilities around the, the, the criteria that relates to uh, the organization reflecting the community they serve. We're, we're going to be you know, clarifying uh, or suggesting clarification how organizations consider uh, the experience of being a person with low income. You know, last year was how many folks on your board, staff, and your leadership um, have experienced being a low income individual. This year, we wanted to bring more clarity to the implications of that since I think that low income can mean many things. And we, we, we narrowed it to folks with lived, you know, folks who have had uh, experience with housing or food insecurity. And so we're just broadening that up to speaking to financial insecurity, you know, people with experience. And we're just we're providing more clarity so folks have a sense how to, when they self identify into these categories, it's folks with financial insecurity that may impact their health, transportation, food, housing, or child care. Um, we can get in, I mean, I can, we can get into sort of some of the rationale there, but that'll be one of the changes. So make sure we're clear, you know, I know there's a lot of pushback on the GHG cost effectiveness criteria. We had called it last time. We adjusted that naming to GHG impact. And we're going to go back to cost effectiveness because that is truly what it is. And it was, in a sense, it was um, just a, it, it's a more it's a more accurate reflection of what that criteria is, and wanting to be clear about that. And then on the workforce requirements, this is this is one area. That, and and I know we've we've talked about this, so I welcome feedback, Jeffrey. Likewise, is just adding a demonstration or documentation of good faith efforts to comply with the workforce utilization uh, commitments and, and workforce goals, so that it gives us so that we can. So we can better push an understanding where 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 that is that that's going to be a clear expectation for folks that they're going to that as we work with folks on projects then we get a better sense for um, how they're how they're meeting our goals that we're going to require them to demonstrate and document their good faith effort. Do folks have any questions or thoughts? I mean, or kind of a clear idea of of um, wh of what we might need to get from here to um, kind of allowing a, or approving us to move forward with um, finalizing RFP documents. Does that path feel clear to people, Robin? Um. That last comment about workforce requirements is adding demonstration documentation of a good faith effort. Um, can uh, maybe elaborate on it? Is that like just a pledge that you know says I will or we will kind of you know um, pursue these these commitments, um, or is is that something that we can? Uh, I'm always hesitant to add reporting, but. Um, is that something that we could kind of incorporate as as a reporting question? And and where I'm coming from is you know having been uh, you know someone who has applied for grants and had to you know deploy grants and and whatnot. You know I often not often I sometimes focus on what do I have to report back to um, the foundation? And if I know that I have to report back how we did on workforce utilization. I would give that a little bit more priority as I'm, I'm deploying the project, as opposed to just you know a good faith effort that that might be a pledge. So maybe can you clarify what that good faith effort might entail? Yeah, I, yeah, I think, and and I see hands going up. So maybe I don't know. I, I'm looking at the hands. I'm wondering if folks want to chime in first before I respond or ask any questions. So the, the, the way that I think we, we see this playing out is right now we've got requirements around, and, and, and so for the projects that are single site, $350,000 or more, 
we got workforce and contractor utilization requirements, apprentice utilization requirements. And and so, and that's different from last time where we told folks, tell us what you're gonna do this time, they're, they're, they're requirements for their those commitments. At the same end, we know that there's gonna be instances where folks may, folks may for one reason or another come to us and say, we can't, we can't meet this. And it's, we're, we're in a challenging position, but we need to send the signal pretty early on that if they're gonna say that they can't meet that, that they need to fully detail and document exactly who they've reached out to and show us that they picked up the phone, called the pre-apprenticeship programs, called the apprenticeship, you know, called, called, called the various places to, to, and, and as well as the various contractor support outfits to make sure that those efforts have been made. And, and, and it's something more than sort of the, yes, I did it. So it's really, detailing the the nature of which that they've made those efforts so we can we can gut check whether they've they've done all those things and and, and it gives us gives us more gives us more avenue to, to understand um what they've done and just clearly set that expectation from the outset that we're going to be expecting that um so that's that's where and, and and so for the projects below that as well um we're i've got to check back and my memory is just not perfect around how how this would be employed there but that's certainly how we'd expect it on the on those projects that are three hundred fifty thousand dollars or more. Sorry, Rancis and then Megan. Now, thanks for that question, Robin, and thanks, Sam, for that exp explainer. Um, I think um, and Jeffrey's probably more knowledgeable than I am on this um, on the contracting side, but definitely from. What I've heard a lot from workforce advocates is like good faith isn't necessarily always a best term because uh, folks want to see results. So I think documentation is, I think, a good improvement on ensuring when we're hearing from contractors that they're saying we can't meet the workforce goals or, you know, there are no women or people of color who want to work here or, you know, we don't see diverse businesses, you know, <laughs> who want to bid on these projects. Like I think I think documentation at least is a good step. You know, uh, there, we're, we're at a stage of we need to verify what's what's real. Um, and I think that's, it is an improvement, but I, I will say historically, good faith effort um, has not been documented. Um, and so I think, especially in the workforce places, and I think there's better probably case studies of where documentation for good faith in diverse contracting has been. So I think it's just in the details how it's it's executed, but I, I kind of agree with your assessment, Robin, like when it's explicit, um, what you have to report, whether it's the grantee or the the contractor, I think I think it, it, it does put more onus to, to show that there was an actual um, good faith to meet the goal. Megan? Hi, my, my comment kind of goes in a little bit of a different direction. So I don't know if any, if Sammy wanted to respond or is it okay if I just plow on? I think so. I mean, I think I, I maybe the response references, I think you're, you're absolutely right in that the implementation for on our end of how we, how we do that and understand that is going to be something that I certainly expect that we'll be reaching out to you and others on the committee to, to, to just to both point us in the direction of folks that can help shore that up and make sure that we're thinking about that appropriately and in a, at the appropriate junction. So making sure, but, but at the RFP stage that we are communicating this expectation that this would be there. Um, go ahead. So I guess my comments are, I'm appreciating this kind of deliberation we're having and the clear presentation you all have given and um, all the feedback that was collected. And I still, or I mean, I'm, thinking a lot about the support we've heard from applicants and some of the attendees tonight and in some of the feedback and also some of the calls for changes and trying to, you know, hone in with the points you made on like where can, where can and should we make some improvements to this. Um, and so I've already heard you call out ones I'm excited to see us make, which is simpler, clearer communication. I think that's always a challenge as Anissa pointed out, like, and I still think we can be doing better in our application process and in our public outreach and in our accompanying materials to the application process. So hoping um, staff is really kind of taking a deep look at like simplifying language and steps. And we have a lot of criteria and in some ways I think that's really robust and I still wonder if there's any ways we can edit down. Um, so that's, I'm glad to hear we're thinking about it and looking forward to looking for that in the next kind of version. 
I'm glad to hear we'll be offering example projects from the last round. I think that's just going to be helpful to kind of create the story of what we've accomplished and also help new applicants kind of imagine future projects with great impact and just kind of build, build the program out. So I'm glad to hear you're all going to be sharing those and I look forward to seeing that. And then an area I'm thinking a lot about is this like numbers you showed us of 34% of the points going towards equity, which I thought was great. And I'm pretty happy with that number overall, given that's one of our guiding principles and one of the core values of what voters voted on and all that. Um, and I'm, I think we could do better on the 26% on greenhouse gas points. Um, and especially because I actually think we're taking, a, we might be moving eight to the other category and we're moving another eight of cost effectiveness if I understood all those possible proposals. And so I wonder if we do need to enhance a really specific reviews of green, and I know we do it in a technical review and in like all projects must, but um, at the end of the day, I think we kind of want to see a Venn diagram or something of all of our criteria kind of falling within climate action and social justice, our guiding principles, I guess. So um, I think that's a point of, that I would like to kind of deliberate on more is that sort of that balance. Um, and I think it's that if I look at our criteria more closely, I think we actually are pushing for climate stuff in some of the other criteria too, or we could be in um, just by asking, but uh, I, I think that's a, kind of an area of deliberation for me and thinking is that that point. So that's, that's what I have right now. <laughs> I have a question, I guess, for the committee, Megan, on that. I, and I've been thinking about this. Um, I mean, we've all been thinking about this on the staff a lot. I think um, if kind of if the outcome that we're after is sort of um, increasing GHG emissions reduction and trying to figure out how to do that within our scoring criteria and our and the way that we evaluate things, I can't really think of um, ways to do that other than prioritizing larger projects that do that have do more ghg or increasing the val increasing the weight associated with cost effectiveness so like if you have twenty dollars and you want more of something you either have to like get more dollars and buy more of it or you have to you know buy the least the least cost of that thing and so I think, I guess, I, I guess I'm just interested in what other folks' thoughts are in hearing, like what the outcome that maybe you're thinking about that you're um, feeling like we might not be getting is, like what is that outcome? And then also thinking about kind of how we might actually, you know, incentivize that in our scoring criteria related to GHG. And if it helps, we can scroll back to those slides if that's something that'd be helpful since. Robin? I'm not gonna directly answer your question, but um, <laughs> um, I, 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 what, what Megan just said, something that intrigued me is, uh, I would be curious if it's easy to do that Venn diagram to see how you know the criteria um, uh, how it's balanced around uh, our guiding principles. And, um, you know, not to say that that's a perfect measurement, uh, but it's just, you know, we're, we do a lot of our work on the guiding principles, and I'd be kind of curious to see how, you know, the criteria lines up on on that. Um, and, and, and then I think if there's an opportunity or if there's a better way of representing that, you know, I'm open to that. But um, it'd be interesting to see the, the balance and then, you know, then maybe we can have some ideas about, you know, how to, how to rebalance things, or maybe it's okay. We can, I know that we can conceptually, I know that we can conceptually scroll back to the, the, the earlier slides with the tables and but it isn't, it's not gonna be the same visual. We can talk about where they, they look, but um, that. But it may just be better to prepare that Venn diagram and come back to that. What maybe in, in, in that, um,
I think as we've had these conver- as we as we have had these conversations, um, you know, internally and in, in, in thinking through, you know, and anticipating some of some of this, I think that it has been a thinking around, you know, the 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 outcomes that you know when we shift points, if there was a you know if there was a movement of points, just what would be. Is it? Is it? Because there, there it, it's. I think there is a very real feeling, and I, I don't. I don't want to. Dis- I, I. I think you all heard the the, feed, the feedback loud and clear. But in thinking about in, in shifting additional points, either to cost effectiveness or indirect GHG, or, or whether there's another criteria, whether that would change the nature of the projects that we would get, or whether that would because we would take. I guess it's just a trade off of where those points come from. I think there is this. The desire to see this optically, this balance, and yet I think that is why I wanted to kind of speak to that eligibility criteria. That there is no project that that, that there is no proposal that makes it past eligibility. That at least as it relates to green infrastructure, regenerative ag, and clean energy, that doesn't that doesn't align with our funding categories. And so, it's to the extent is that within there, would you want to see a more greater emphasis on cost effectiveness? greater emphasis on 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 bill reduction and generally i mean i know i would i would argue if we're thinking about at least clean energy projects utility bill reductions will be correlated with with greenhouse gas and very closely highly correlated to greenhouse gas emissions reduction and then the core the core you know where we take because i think the internal tension as we've talked to this is those points will come from there's only so many places those points can can come from and what do we what do we what do we sacrifice or is it about um, an additional or a newer criteria or something. So we can, um, I, I, I just want to ask that in terms of, as you, as you'll think about the, the, the criteria themselves around what, um, what is it that we want to see um, in, in placing, in potentially placing more weight in one of those areas. I don't want to add, I don't want to add, uh, thanks. Um, I don't want to add more layer of complexity on the cost effectiveness model, but I will say, in, in the greenhouse gas reduction, uh, I, I want to remind folks like, I think what we're assuming here is these are what we're being presented by applicants are projections for greenhouse gas reductions. And, and, and I think there's some assumptions on cost effectiveness. So for any, savvy person, I think it, it's not just what happens as what's being projected in the front end, but what actually happens on the back end. So I think uh, like for, for me, like history of performance, the quality of the installer, the quality of installation really matters. That is not sometimes forgotten both in the projection of greenhouse gas reductions as well as cost effectiveness. So for, so for example, in the energy efficiency space, quality of the insulation installation, I think, is an area that cost effectiveness oftentimes uh, you can give the lowest cost for building and, and award the lowest um, contractor, but you might not get quality installation that after the project's over. That might be an area that has to be redone. Heating and lighting is another area where we project a lot of impact uh, projections around greenhouse gas uh, emission reductions but unless there's those items are installed in a in a a well meaningful manner like if you actually the difference between a licensed electrician and unlicensed significant impact on uh on greenhouse gas reduction so i'm sorry i know i'm adding another layer of complexity here so I, i do think it's important that we figure out this this balance between um how we're weight, weighting and scoring, you know, GHG reductions. Again, to me, they're projections and, and as well as cost effectiveness. But to me, I think there are other variables that are important um, a- after after those dollars are awarded and, and how we think about that as a system um, and, and evaluating that. Um, but sorry, I, I knew I was gonna at least add a comment that just adds another layer of complexity. And I think it applies to other areas as well.
I'd love to hear. I'd love to just prompt anyone. You, you, I think you're right. going to go. Apparently, Sam and I have the exact same amount of time. We are comfortable with silence, which is why we always start talking at the same moment. Um, I just wanted to, I guess, ask other committee members about sort of thoughts related to that. Like, I mean, Megan kind of elevated this. Um, I don't know if it's a concern or just kind of like wanting to explore further this, like this question of are we um, putting enough emphasis on GHG and kind of how that shows up in our in our evaluation. And so I'm just interested in seeing if other committee members have thoughts um, related to that. Robin? All right, so I, I don't like silence either, but I tried to give a pause to see if anybody else comments. Just one quick comment. I guess what I want to see is, is kind of an intentional balance uh, that, you know, it, it, however we do this, that, you know, it, we might end up skewing one of these criteria areas more than the other, but as long as we're intentional about it. And I feel right now, uh, I think we're okay. Um, Maybe it could be tweaked, maybe it could be a little better, but um, that's why I think I, I, I like the notion of some type of, you know, Venn diagram or something that kind of shows the balance of things. Um, but if, if that's not possible or people don't think that's necessary, I, I, I think I'm okay with where we're at right now, um, but it'd be nice to get some data. Robin, I think we can bring, I think we can absolutely bring a Venn diagram in some ways just to be able to hear from you all just additional thoughts because it would, what it helps us do is think about whether we need to think about alternatives and alternative options to bring you all just beyond that sort of visual presentation of how it, it looks, it'd be, it, it, it's helpful. Any any other thoughts on sort of just the, the, that, that end outcome that you, you want to see potentially more of and, and we can think about how to how to either talk that through next time or or, or illustrate that in an, in an alternative option. Faith and then Megan. I really don't have anything substantive to add, but you were looking for comments. And so I just wanted to chime in and say that I'm really, really happy with the intentionality that's here. I think that a lot of um, the concern is it's really valid, right? It's really valid that we uh, heard from the public that they didn't know where the GHG was. And I think there's a very legitimate, um, well thought out response to that as well. Like this is an eligibility uh, criteria and we need to keep it so. And I feel like it is actually really intentionally balanced as Robin was just saying. And the more ways we can see that and evaluate that and test that that's true, I think the better. I, I also was super attracted to the idea of the Venn diagram. Um, not that that solves you know everything for us, but I think the visual will be really nice. Um, and I, I think we also just we're, we're looking for the projects and that's how we're going to that's how we're going to test that what we have is is the right criteria. I also think that the examples are going to be, as Megan was saying earlier, I think that will be so extremely helpful for telling the story of PCEF. And we also need to remember that we don't have to send all the money out the door if we don't get projects that meet our eligibility criteria. And I think I've right read some underlying fear about that in some of the comments um, that there would be um, that there was a motivation to fund projects that don't meet the the criteria and I don't think that we have that so um, nor do I think that we really saw that last time so I don't I don't think that's a fear based in in what we've seen in evidence we've seen today anyway so I just wanted to share that I am comfortable with where we are so far and I really appreciate the diligence that's gone into to being able to tell that story and to being open and reflective to the comments that we've received. Thanks, Faith. Megan? 
Well, I'm open to hearing from folks who haven't spoken as much since I feel like I've gotten to talk a lot tonight. But Katie, you asked like on um, just on this topic. I mean, I just proposed a Venn diagram because I could kind of, I think we kind of did that exercise with RFP one. It might not have been that visual, but where we showed and it didn't come through in the draft RFP two that went to the public, I don't think, or in perhaps in so anyway, I think we have versions of it, but I could imagine that the current Venn diagram, if we had the four guiding principles like accountability, justice driven, that actually all of our criteria balances out a bit um, in there and there's a few in the middle of it all. Um, but I guess just an, an alternative to, to look at that would be interesting was if you if staff brought us one that really added a lot more to the GHG one and like kind of tell us what trade-offs that would require or is it more like underscoring the connection in our current criteria to that? Um, and I am eager to consider whether simplifying our criteria is a possibility, just because I'm kind of hearing some of the other ongoing feedback about simplification, both as reviewers ourselves, but also the public just generally. It's a, I think our criteria is robust and really thoughtful, and it's probably possible to shorten it still again. Um, so if that's possible to do while doing any other work, that seems worth asking staff to consider to bring us to consider. Um, so those are the kind of two points I would love to sort of see, because at least it gives us a sense of what we're choosing. Yeah, I think, I don't know. I, th I think I, I think I understand the request. I, I think and and Faith, you might I think you might have thoughts on this just having worked in the um, in the sort of particularly in the clean energy world where cost effectiveness tests are sort of to have such a long history. Um, I think probably less so in regenerative ag and green infrastructure uh, infrastructure just because those aren't really sectors that have you know been particularly funded um, much in the past. But in the clean energy space, um, they really are associated with lighter retrofits, less deep touch, and in many ways, driving the benefits of those programs to middle and upper income um, white communities. And so there was a, a lot of input at the very beginning, sort of at the inception of the program from community-based organizations and from, and from technical experts and building scientists who were like, don't kill this with cost effectiveness. Let us do deep energy retrofits that improve homes, improve the life of the home, the building, improve the indoor air quality. And so we knew that there, we, we still do have, you know, knowing that there is this trade off between like GHG impact and, um, and other, you know, the GHG impact related to cost effectiveness, we, we still have it in there, but that's, but it is but the um, conversation and the intention was to try and balance it with an incentive to go deep, particularly on the energy side, like on the energy efficiency side. So the criteria related to doing, you know, lowering utility bills, that's to try and incentivize projects that will do deep energy efficiency retrofits, because in many ways, any cost effectiveness test is going to disincentivize that. And so that, that was um, the balance. And, um, I know I'm not a committee member, but I will just say as a staff person who, um, you know, does come from uh, many years working in, um, in the energy industry, this is one that is um, sort of like the, the whole country, across the whole country, energy efficiency programs, this is sort of like the, the thing that keeps the benefits from low-income communities and communities of color. Well, to me, I mean, I'm, yeah, I heard you and Ranfi sort of accentuate this point. And then to me, it's simply that we're just not communicating that as clearly as we could be maybe in the criteria when we say lowers costs, maybe we just have to draw out that connection that you've made for me very clearly, a little more clearly. And I think we kind of do in the evaluation rubric, but maybe in the end, just the short phrasing of it to the public doesn't like, you don't you, I wouldn't necessarily make that jump right away that like there's a greenhouse gas component to lowering costs, especially coming from the regenerative ag world, because you could mean food produced because um, that lowers totally. monthly meal costs, which is very important. And I think it is something we should value, but it doesn't have necessarily a very measurable greenhouse gas reduction. And, and the regenerative ad world is harder to measure in all this stuff. And some of our critics, um, I, I don't find like their comments, we have a regenerative ad category for a reason and it's just, it can't be held to the same sort of measurable standards. But also Renfi's brought up points about 
sort of the long-term projected versus realized outcomes. And I don't know how we can kind of be reflective about, more reflective about that, but it seems like we're really going for these long-term deep ones. Um, and so if somehow we can just bring that forward a little bit more clearly, to me, that would perhaps go a long way. Yeah. I think and this is a, and this is something that we do have, you know, we do have quality assurance and and other standards that we've that we've been working on that we've that we've developed, and so um, this is an area where we, we just, I you know, it's it's the complexity of how we layer and share all this information out there from the outset, um, but there is a there's a, there's a tremendous amount, so it, it's given us a good bit to think about. As I as I know, I'm, I want to think about just some of the asks here. Sometimes it's helpful to know, like, what is, what are we, you know, is there a project in a sense, or is there a thing in a sense that we're afraid of? Because it helps us sort of work back from that and think about whether there is, a, whether there is something that you're like, you know, I want to, I want to, just to, if there is something out there, because, you know, I, I certainly reflect back on looking at the projects that rose to the top of the last round, and. And, and as I look back at both those that rose to the top of last round and those that, that, and that got funded and those that didn't um, on the implementation grants where we had a lot more details. I think planning grants are always going to be harder and they're always going to be subject to, I think they, they, they can be subject to criticism. And I think we will, that's something that we're going we're gonna to have to navigate. But as it relates to the implementation grants, um, as I look back at those, it feels very, you know, feels very well that those, those those really hit the sweet spot of all the objectives that folks had laid out in terms of the kind of investments you all wanted to see. And so it is, I guess, it's just a question that I have is, is there, is there in some ways projects or things that you have in mind and don't feel like I don't want to put, you know, I know we're short in time, don't feel like, you know, you don't want to put, put folks on the spot, but it would just be helpful even if you just send staff, uh, send myself for Katie an email that is like, this is what I was thinking about that I'd be concerned about, 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 about elevating to the top. And that can also just help us on the other side think about it. Short of that, I know that we can come back with both just different visualization and 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 a couple at least options for food for food for thought and to be able to at least talk about the implications of them. So you at least have a counter to to, to be able to think about what we currently have in front of us. We can, we can do that. We're about at the point in the meeting, I mean, we've got one minute on the agenda until closing comments. So, um, and I know we're keeping you half, an extra half hour for the meetings this week. So really want to just appreciate you and know um, that it's kind of late. Everybody's um, probably getting a little, little tired of looking at a computer, but um, if there are any committee members who want to make any closing comments before we, um, before we close the meeting. Okay. I, I'll just want to follow on to Katie, what you shared and, and Sam, what you just asked as well. I, I totally agree with everything that Katie said about cost effectiveness in the renewable energy or clean energy and energy efficiency space. The cost effectiveness tests that are established in by uh, or, or um, lead to investment by utilities um, and are established by utilities, right, have led to the, the kind of need for PCEF in those kind of projects. And so I guess that is also the answer I would give to you, Sam, is what kind of project am I afraid of seeing the business as usual project that can be funded with other sources? Thanks, Faith. Nobody else has any comments. I feel like that was a little bit of kind of like a mic drop, drop public com or, you know, closing comments. So I appreciate that space. I'm just going to um, hand it off to Sam to say good night. And then um, mm -hmm. we will talk to you all again sooner than we usually do.
appreciate you all just joining us for this sprint. I mean, we're excited to get this out there. And I just want to share there's a lot of possible excitement out there and, and eagerness to see the RFP. So I know that this is a big ask and just want to just offer my profound appreciation for, for you all, for you all being in this journey with us and, and, and getting close and, and, and we're excited to come back and see you all Friday. Yeah. Bye. All right. Good night, all. Good night, everyone. Members of Bye, everyone.